Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our first quarterly connections meeting with the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative. My name is Lisa Stoner and I'm the coordinator for the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative. We are joined today by our planning team and I encourage you all to take a look at our website, which I'm sure you already have done. I'll drop that link to our website here. You've already been there. But um, this is with a group um, of, as this, of this size. We have four uh, co-hosts today, myself, Anil Seth, Kate McGargle, John Barentine. And But we do have other planning members here with us today. We're also with um, our very special speaker today with Ruskin Hartley. And we'll be introducing Ruskin here momentarily. So it's wonderful to see you all. Um, thank you for joining us. Today, we'd like to um, welcome everyone together to help foster more connections, to reconnect perhaps if you have been involved for a long time. I'm still somewhat new, um, but we hope to broaden our understanding of the most important issues. What are people experiencing today? We wanna to learn from each other and support each other. Um, ultimately to be more effective in our unique roles as we work towards preserving naturally dark skies. And I'd like to um, explain a little bit about what to expect. So in terms of um, our group introductions, I'm gonna have Anil support us in this where he will be providing in the chat a link to a Google doc. And in there, we're gonna have you write your name and address a couple of questions that we'll be prompting you with. And that way we can kind of get a little information simultaneously and you have a moment there to read others. And then it will be a document that we can share um, later that we can use to help assess what are your current um, concerns and um, interests in being at this meeting. There will be four parts to this meeting today. Um, We'd like to first, um, we'll have a little context and history on the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative provided by John Barentine, um, how we got started and the mission um, and some current priorities in the direction that we're going with the Dark Sky Cooperative. Next, we'll, we'll move into the group introduction with, with Anil's support um, with the Google, doc, Google document. We will then um, proceed into welcoming and hearing from our invited guest, Ruskin Hartley, who will be presenting his work with the International Dark Sky Association. Followed finally, uh, we'll have our Q&A and discussion, guided discussion. Um, Anil will be our, our host for this as well. Um, and lastly, at the very end, I do hope we're gonna reserve a little bit of time for our meeting today to, uh, I will be sending an email just promptly after this meeting to anyone who has been invited or registered, who they can um, complete a feedback survey that will address, again, questions like, why are you here? And we want to know what you are involved with, with your dark sky work and um, suggestions for uh, future meetings that we have planned. So, um, I'd like to um, transition to um, leading, leading into John's talk, um, a little more of the background on the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative and our mission. Um, John, would you like to um, join us? Welcome. Yes, welcome. Thank you, Lisa. I'm going to share my screen. I just have a couple of slides. Bear with me here for a moment. Uh, and I'm not gonna take up any more than five minutes. I'm gonna watch my time very carefully. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the background of the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative and um, how we have recently sort of redefined its mission and what we call its priorities rather than a, a necessarily a strategy, but what do we want to do with this organization. Um, there's a little timeline. This is something that Aubrey Christensen, who was one of the previous coordinators of the Plateau, put together some time ago that highlights some of the dates um, leading up to the establishment of the cooperative in 2012, but it actually reaches back uh, over a decade before to the formation of the National Park Service um, Night Sky Team within the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division. Um, and 
there, things happen along the way. The main thing that I want you to focus on is where it says 2002, the idea of a large contiguous expanse of dark skies is discussed. The Park Service had designated a number of these areas. This is a Park Service product that uses the light at night maps that you probably have seen before called the, artificial, the World Atlas of Artificial Night Sky Brightness. And you've seen these little dashed areas here that they've identified these dark um, pools or reservoirs of natural nighttime darkness in different parts of the country. And the idea was that they would concentrate efforts in preserving those where they still exist uh, protecting them out here in the West and trying to grow them where possible. And one of the earliest that was, uh, there was a lot of focus through the night sky team was the Colorado Plateau that you can see there sort of left and below center. But there, the idea would eventually expand and part of that involved bringing in the Great Basin uh, a couple of years later. So there's a cooperative there as well. But in the future, we might see similar cooperatives in any of these areas. Uh, again, under the, the, the broad auspices of the uh, National Park Service. Uh, so this was an experiment that began in 2012. This was the announcement of the creation of the Dark Sky Cooperative. Uh, it was an NPS effort from the beginning. They decided to uh, work with an academic partner, which in that case was the University of Utah, to house the cooperative in its earliest period. Um, you'll notice some things in the little statement there below about it being a voluntary effort that this was not necessarily government led or a government project, but they would uh, voluntarily solicited the cooperation of all of these different stakeholders uh, in a collaborative effort to celebrate the view of the cosmos, minimize the impact of outdoor lighting, and ultimately restore natural darkness to the area. So it's an extension of some of the work that IDA, for example, has done through its Dark Sky Places program. Um, but also a developing sense of best practice, particularly with respect to public lands. Uh, it's been quite successful. This is a, a map showing the location of some of the international dark sky places in the four corner states. And I've drawn a rough boundary of the Colorado Plateau around it in green. And that green area encloses uh, one of the highest densities of dark sky places over any region in the world. You can see some of the numbers uh, that are, are on that. And again, if we compare it back to that uh, satellite derived light at night map, uh, it's easy to understand why it's still an abundant resource in this part of the country, but it is threatened. And there's a recognition of that there has been for some time. And so part of the point of the cooperative uh, is to provide a network of resources and individuals who can not only celebrate what we have, but also protect it and try to even improve the situation where possible. So when Lisa came on board a while back as the uh, coordinator for the cooperative, we decided to take a high level look at what the organization does. And so we wrote a new mission statement to guide the work. And in particular, I've highlighted here in orange what I think is the most important set of words, which is to share expertise and develop resources. The cooperative has always been from its uh, inception, a way to bring people together, to get people to know one another so that they don't feel like they're sort of lost out there in the wilderness trying to do this all themselves. Uh, and to, for them to realize that there are abundant resources available to anybody who wants to pursue this. And we've seen a lot of collaboration in and among those groups over time as the cooperative has matured. I think is part of what demonstrates uh, the value of it. And that again was modeled for the benefit of the folks in Nevada who set up um, their own version in the Basin and Range province. And then lastly, again, I've highlighted the stuff that I think is important. We wrote a handful of, of what we call our priorities that are things that we want to do in the next few years with the plateau. Some of this is a continuation of work that has been ongoing for a while. Um, some of it is new. Um, but you see there's, again, a, a lot of recurring uh, themes here, supporting IDSP accreditation, supporting the gateway communities, especially near parks and public lands, um, developing astrotourism. I think that's going to be the big accomplishment of this decade. Uh, I would like to see is a much more extensive astrotourism enterprise on the plateau. We really want to extend the knowledge of the science and art uh, of the night, flight pollution of the cosmos. We wanna share knowledge and news within the relevant subjects that touch on all of this. And we wanna put it in a context of environmental stewardship while being careful 
how we put that to the community so that it is not seen as something threatening, but rather something that's inviting and that ultimately we will uh, bring more people in as a consequence. So I think that's my roughly five minutes and I thank you for your attention and I will hand it back over to Lisa. All right. Thank you, John, appreciate that. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Neil, who would like to do um, an introduction with our whole group so we can all get to know who we all are on this call today. Thank you, Anil. Yeah, so um, we're just going to, in the chat, I put, and I'm going to put it once more in case someone just came in, uh, a link to a Google Doc. Uh, so you can just click on that. It should take you to a Google Doc that you can start writing in. Um, and um, the I will share that here. Um, so you can see we have uh, the idea is just type your name and where you're from and any organizational affiliation. If you have some time, you can um, you can also talk about your dark sky work and what motivates you to do that work. Um, and we're just going to spend a, a few minutes here uh, and you can write. And if when you're done writing, you can look at other people's. Um, so I'll just kind of scroll through these as we are doing that. Great to see people from all over the plateau. All right. And if anyone is having any issues, you can just write in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask me. Got a uh, quote from The Hobbit here. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Great to e meet you all here. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm not keeping track of time real well. Are we at the? We have a few more, a couple more minutes for people to type and read, and then we'll move on to um, our speaker.
Okay. Great, Rich. I'm going to copy and paste your thing into uh, into the doc, Google Doc here too. Oops, sorry. Anil, I'll just say as we um, proceed forward, this is wonderful to have everyone introducing themselves in this way. We have never done this before, um, but I think we will we'll certainly will share this so that you have a chance to study this later. Um, I also, one thing I didn't mention is as we proceed into our special speaker today, we invite you to, as some are doing now, use the chat. We want you to use the chat if you have questions or you can raise your hand um, during um, our presentation and we'll try to address all those questions as best as we can. So Anil, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Okay, great. So, um... It's my pleasure to be able to introduce Ruskin Hartley. Ruskin is uh, the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director at IDA, or as we're going to learn soon, it's called now Dark Sky International. Um, and uh, Ruskin was born in the UK uh, and, um, and did his education there before, uh, I think, sounds like lived in California for a number of years working in the nonprofit industry, managing conservation programs that uh, um, in different land, water and of land, water and ocean resources. Um, he was executive director of Save the Redwoods League uh, and CEO of Heal the Bay in Los Angeles uh, and vice president of resource development at Fair Trade USA. Um, he's been with, I think this is his fourth year now as a leader of IDA. Um, and uh, leading us through this very uh, challenging time that we're living in right now. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Ruskin. He's going to tell us a little bit about uh, his vision of how this is going to go forward. Thank, thanks, Anil. And it's a pleasure to be with everyone. I really appreciate the invitation. And hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm trying some new earbuds. So give me a thumbs up if you can hear. <laughs> so it's great to see some uh, familiar faces, some familiar names, and some, some new faces and new names. If, if, if I can, I'm going to do that classic boring Zoom thing of uh, share a screen so you don't just have to look at the background in my son's bedroom where I have been working for the last several years. <laughs> um, so let's, let's go here. So yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Anil, for the introduction. And, and thank you again to my former colleague, John, actually, for sharing a fantastic history of how the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative came into being. I'm really excited for the vision that is presented there and the opportunities that lie ahead. Um, as Anil mentioned, this, this is actually where I live for most of the last 20 plus years in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, under this, as all my kids said, why did someone throw a blanket over the sky? Why, why can't we see the stars anymore? And this is the Bay Bridge with its uh, beautiful lights that are, are now broken and need $11 million to replace them. And, and there's somewhat uh, an interesting debate going on in the San Francisco Bay Area about whether a temporary light exhibit should become a permanent light exhibit, exhibition. And I, I'm really gonna say, I, I didn't know what I was missing until I moved to Tucson, Arizona to join the International Dark Sky Association as ex executive director. Who knows why they picked me? Because I knew nothing about light pollution. I knew nothing about astronomy. Well, a little bit about astronomy. I could I could spot the plow because I grew up in, in, in the United Kingdom. And I, I remember many years ago, my parents dragging me out of bed in the middle of the night to see Haley's Comet. And so I, I've been aware of it, but I didn't really know what I was missing until I came to Tucson and realized that you can step outside your Door, and I live a little, those of you know John, I live a little bit further east than John out by Saguaro National Park. And on most days, most evenings, you can step outside your door without a flashlight. And within a few minutes, you can navigate around. And I promise this is the only bad astrophotography fixture I will share, but I'm proud of it because I took it. And that's the Milky Way over my home <laughs> here in Tucson, Arizona, on the outskirts of the city of, I don't know, half a million people. Uh, in a metro area of a million. So it really shows that we can we can maintain some of that connection to the stars. What, what I wanted to do today is, I mean, I'm gonna start with the assumption that most people on this 
call, uh, understand what light pollution is and how it's caused and a little bit about the impact. So I'm not gonna go much into that. Um, that that's for another time, another day. If you don't know that, come back to these meetings, I'm sure it will be covered in the future. What, what, what I wanted to do is share a little bit about the work that um, I have done with our board of directors uh, last year. Um, as, as Anil mentioned, I've been, I've been here four years and our strategic plan had run its course. And so as all good nonprofits do, we have to develop, we have to look at our strategic plan. We have to look at where we need to go in the coming years. And that's what we did um, with our board of directors, uh, 12, 13 people, really um, half of them in the US, half of them outside the US, bringing engineers, astronomers, lighting professionals, uh, ecologists, astrophotographers, um, astrotourism professionals, and just dark sky advocates together in a conversation about where have we come and where do we need to go? And that's what I wanted to share with you today. We started by really challenging our assumptions. And, and I think it's very easy in this space to sort of pat ourselves on the back and say, yeah, we've done some great work, right? You know, we, we have, IDA arguably has been part of what has helped put light pollution on the map uh, over the last 30 years. And, and, and as John shared, you know, our, our programs are, are well known. Um, but as we'll also look, light pollution has continued to accelerate. So there's a disconnect here. And so really, as a, our, our programs is the work that we're all collectively doing, um, growing quickly enough to meet the sort of challenges that are, that are out there, or do we need a new approach? And I, I think, on the, on the, as, as again, as refer back to John, but you know, Colorado Plato has the greatest density of dark sky places on, 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 on probably on the world, which is fantastic. And there are now over 200 international dark sky places around the world. Um, you know, IDEA has certified thousands of dark sky approved fixtures. You can go to the Home Depot or Lowe's and you can buy a fixture that will get the job done and not point light into the sky. And, and there is a thing, there is a dark sky movement around the world. It's great, it's fantastic. It wasn't even here probably even 10 years ago. And to some degree, IDEA is recognized as a leader in this field, but, and yet there's always a but. <laughs> and I want to just hit on some of the buts that we identified, even in the Colorado Plateau, those parks are isolated parks, they're isolated communities. They have not been knit together into a large landscape of protection, even in the Colorado Plateau. Uh, and if you look worldwide, the dark sky parks are being protected. They tend to be in remote places. They tend to be small parts of the landscape. They are not approaching the level of protection that's needed. Uh, yes, we have thousands of dark sky fixtures, but there's still, if you go into Home Depot or Lowe's, there's many more terrible fixtures that you can buy out there. Same in the commercial sector. Um, yes, there is a dark sky movement. You no, know, we are mighty, we're small, we are increasingly coming together in gatherings like this, but we are small and fragmented compared to many other uh, causes uh, out there. And the movement has also tended to focus on raising awareness. Uh, and beyond our dark sky places program, just acknowledge that IDA has not provided very many intentional roadmaps or frameworks for engagement. We also looked hard at kind of what is the state of play. Um, and I've changed this slide, in fact, since th th we updated our strategic plan with one important number, that 10% number, from the science paper that was published earlier this year. As we know now from Globe at Night, light pollution has grown over the last decade. Actually, a 12-year period has been growing at 10% per year globally. Um, a little bit less in Europe, probably a little bit more in the US. So it, it's, it's running away out of control. And these are from visual observers from um, people around the world. I think 50,000 observations were taken or crunched by Chris Kyber and Connie Walker. And they came to the conclusion that the best way to explain it is the night sky is getting brighter. And as a result, people are seeing fewer and fewer stars. Someone who is 18 today, when they are born, there's probably twice as many stars in the sky. When they are born, they're now 18, there's half the many left. But what does that mean? Um, and I think this is what, what you're seeing with, with some of our work going forward and our strategy that I'll talk about is, yes, we want to talk about the heritage and culture of dark skies. Yes, we want to talk about the value of seeing the cosmos for professional astronomers like Anil and amateur astronomers uh, and everyone in between. And just that connection is really important. But there are also, as we know, light pollution also impacts very many other things that people care about to touch their daily lives. Biodiversity. <laughs> You know, you can see some of the numbers there. Most species are, many are nocturnal. And someone put in the chat, you know, all the birds that are migrating to the Salt Lake area at night, you know, and the impact that light pollution has on them. And what we're learning is it's not just bright light. You know, Chris, um, 
Travis Lonko's work shows that light at levels of like a quarter or a half moon levels is impacting the foraging, nesting, reproductive behaviors of fish, grunion, and, and plover. So even light at low levels is having an impact. Uh, clearly, wasted light is wasted energy. We're all focused on climate change. Some of a lot of work has been done on this, and people don't seem to get that the most energy efficient light picture is the one that's either dimmed down or turned off. You know, energy efficient light pictures, if you spew them all over the face, cease to be efficient in aggregate, and we're wasting billions of dollars a year lighting up the night sky. And increasingly, there's work coming on public health and equity. A lot of some of the recent papers will come out of the University of Utah. We're really understanding that light pollution is an issue of public health and is an issue of equity and justice. Uh, poorer communities tend to have one or two things. They either don't have any light <laughs> or they have really junky lights. They have really terrible, they have the worst of the worst. So they're, they're, there's no happy medium there. Um, we also looked about how we have approached this over the last um, 30 years. And, and again, I don't want to knock the work that has gone in the past, but we also wanted to look very carefully at it and say, look, if we keep doing what we're doing, are we going to have a different outcome? And I think when a lot of, certainly when a lot of us went into the planning process, the board members, if you'd asked them at the start, say, what is the issue? They would have said, we have an awareness issue. If only pe more people were aware of the problem, everyone would get on board and we would solve it. Like it, it's the kind of, the classic build a better mousetrap, everyone will buy it and there'll be no mice left, right? And, and time after time, we know just because you build a better mousetrap doesn't mean people will adopt it. Um, and I think over the course of the year of going through this, we realized we moved from, well, yes, we do have an awareness issue, clearly, but really we have an action issue. Our issue is not about awareness. <laughs> like to say, I am aware, like Toby, if you've heard this, me say this before, I'm aware every time I go to the dentist, the dentist says, you should floss your teeth. I'm like, yep. I am aware I should floss my teeth. Do I floss my teeth diligently twice a day? I'm here to tell you, all friends here, right? No, I don't brush, brush my teeth twice a day. And you're shocked, right? And I, you know, I know we should eat healthy and exercise. And yes, I try to, but yeah, I fall off the wagon, right? We, we're all aware of things that there's a disconnect between awareness and action. I think that is the gap that we need to close. And really that puts a finger on the role that public policy was gonna, is gonna have to play Voluntary actions will not accumulate fast enough for us to tackle that runaway rate of light pollution. In terms of the strategic plan, it's, it's, it is brief. It is not a 50-page tome. Um, I had no appetite. No one has no, any appetite to read a 50-page tome. But I did want to share the sort of three slides that are at the heart of this. Um, so one is we... As we came back to the end, we came back, look, given everything we've learned about where we need to go, let's go back and revisit our vision, mission, values, and some of our key terms. And we did make some adjustments here. And I don't have them side by side, but let me just sort of articulate what some of the adjustments are. Um, the vision is natural darkness at night is protected worldwide as essential for people in nature. It's not a nice to have. <laughs> it's a have to have. No, every, every legal thing on the planet has evolved under the constant rhythm of day, night. And you know, the physicists will probably tell me, yes, it's not been quite constant. And it's probably lengthened and changed over time. But it's essentially, that's what we've evolved over. And we, and we need darkness as much as we need light. Plants need darkness as much as they need light. Everything needs darkness as much as we need light. And we've robbed ourselves of that. So our mission, and, and this is what our Kevin Gaston, one of our board members, was really pointing on this is, We've moved past protecting natural darkness, and it's in the mission of the, the cooperative as well, too. We need to restore it. So the, it's, our mission is to restore the nighttime environment and protect communities and wildlife from light pollution. There's precious few places left on the planet that are naturally dark. Most of the places certainly where people live are light polluted. The other key change we made was really to look at the definition of light pollution, uh, and this is not Quite, I mean, a lot of the times we've talked about, well, light pollution is any light that is not useful. So we have kind of banished that. We're saying that light pollution is a true environmental pollution. Light pollution is the alteration of light levels in the outdoor environment from those occurring naturally due to human-made sources of light. We know from Travis Longcore's work that light at very low light levels, you know, equivalent of a quarter moon, will have an impact on ecology. Um, 
this does not mean we are going to turn and advocate that every single light should be turned out. Uh, this will be advocate that we need to start with natural darkness and add light as we need it to meet our needs. Uh, but I think that it's a subtle shift, but I think it's a really important shift for IDA, and it's one I can not has been advocated for for a long time by some of the academics and scientists, particularly coming out of Europe. Uh, and again, the analogy that they have shared with me is the ambulance, you know, heaven forbid you have a loved one that needs to go to the hospital in the middle of the night, but if they do, you want the ambulance to come quickly, you want to take them there, you want them to put its sirens on, <laughs> you want to put its flashing lights on so they can get there quickly through traffic, right? It's it's spewing CO2, it's, it's making noise, and it's spewing light out there. It's causing light pollution, noise pollution, and air pollution, and yet it's really useful. You want your loved one to get there quickly. So just because something is not used, it, something can be a pollutant and useful. And so that's why we changed change that as, as part of the, the, the strategic plan update. The, the core of the strategy is really articulated here, that we really need to move from the left where we're losing the night to the right where we're restoring the dark. Um, and you can see the change there is, you know, that what we have at the moment is obtrusive light is running away in cities and communities and natural darkness is being eroded. And we need to turn it around so cities and communities are embracing responsible lighting and natural darkness is being protected and restored. The key role here, like what's the role that IDA plays? IDA can recruit and mobilize, we can provide resources and tools, we can share your successes and your best practice, we can monitor progress and results, but ultimately, it's going to be the dark sky advocates around the world that are going to be advocating policy solutions that support biodiversity, support climate change, support better responsible use of light at night, light at night. And look at policies that will build a movement. Um, one of the documents this organization produced in the past was the model lighting ordinance. The concept is we will just produce the perfect ordinance and everyone will adopt it and we will solve the problem. It was too complicated and hasn't had the impact we want. We need to be prepared to take incremental steps to move people along this journey. You now, we're trying to work with all of you to figure out what that is, but there are steps that you can take. For instance, California last year failed at the last, but had a bill in place that would have required all new lights in public buildings to point down, be less than 3,000 k and be on a motion sensor and a controller. That's a smart public policy that puts the issue on the table and starts to move in the direction of solving it. And that we believe this flywheel will then you know, drive you know, policy makers to enact policies. The industry will respond to those policies and then consumers, the most of the majority of the consumers who aren't thinking about this, will then when they are making those decisions will be, will be you know, doing, the, doing the right thing, as opposed to relying on the voluntary actions of the consumers to lead, lead the way from the start. In terms of the goals, we established three top level organizational goals um, in the policy arena to really activate advocates to lead movement building policies. In the middle is our Dark Sky Approved program, really build on our work and our Fixture Silver Approval program and particularly our Dark Sky Places program to provide recognition for Dark Sky Places, for people doing the right thing. You know, we want a list of accredited lighting designers. So if you want to hire someone who gets it, these are the people who understand it, have demonstrated their ability to do it. If you want to light a road the right way, yes, you can meet the standards, and here's how you do it from a dark sky perspective. And critically, really looking at collaborations, and here's why groups like this are so excited, and I encourage you to continue this work, and particularly to bring new partners, organizations in, chambers of commerce, community-based organizations, faith-based groups, really the indigenous communities, bring them into this into this conversation, bring them in on these collaborations and identify and really have those discussions about what are your what are your values and what are your interests and how can light pollution and dark sky issues help resolve those. As Anil said, um, the other step we took as part of this was a, to sort of refresh our identity. And, and so from the International Dark Sky Association, it, it's a small but I think important change. You know, dark sky, and particularly Dark Sky International is, uh, and then our strength lies in the global movement. And these are just a snapshot of some of the chapters. And, and to, to, to act like a more coordinated larger body, like you know, just really looking at how can we use some common language, some common identity, and some common brands so we can 
we can act bigger and feel bigger. Um, we also, you know, sort of better identity for our dark sky approved fixture program and our international dark sky places that have really never had a, a professionally designed seal there. So again, trying to, how can we use brand and identity and, and the desire that people have to align with dark sky issues to raise awareness and so that people want to be part of this so that they can be advocating for the right policies in their community. I wanted to share just a couple things before I turn it back to Emil to say some of the tools and things that we're working on that are coming soon and I'm, I'm excited about. Um, so one is a, an enhanced website. We, we have a lot of great information on our website. The common complaint is you have a lot of great information on your website. I can't find anything. Um, we are doing a major rebuild on that website that will be launched soon, along with a new uh, brand identity. And, and over time, we'll build additional resources on that. A couple that are coming uh, later this year, we have been working with the University of Arizona to develop a policy and legal database. There's a project I started with John. Uh, we expect a beta version of this to be published in the next few months. This will be a repository. So if you're you're a small community in Western Massachusetts, considering to, you know, you want to adopt a light pollution policy, well, who's who's who who has done similar work in similar communities? Let's have you be able to pull up those, or your state, or your a country. Now, what can we learn from both of the um, uh, the policy side uh, and then the legal database in terms of the case law that has been enacted that is there that's very hard to access at the moment and the last is i'm, I'm really excited about a, a program to develop much better online learning resources um, one of the common complaints i get or common questions people say you uh, ida dark sky does a great job of telling me what the problem is that's fantastic you then tell me there's a simple solution that's wonderful i get very excited and then, then i say what's the solution and we kind of throw our hands up and say i don't know we don't really have the solution um there is actually no really one place that you can go to learn about quality outdoor lighting um most of the standards here in the us live behind a paywall and there's a very few places that you can go and learn about quality outdoor lighting so we want all of the advocates to be able to, to learn this. Now, what's the difference between the Lux and the Lumen and the Candela? <laughs> if you're writing an ordinance and you're concerned about light trespass, which unit should you use? Are you going to measure it horizontally or vertically? Because what we see is people, well-intentioned citizens getting involved, writing that what they think is a great ordinance, and the professionals look at it and say, we can't enforce it because it hasn't written accurately enough. So we want people to feel knowledgeable and informed and empowered about this. So when you go to a city council meeting, you're talking about these issues and there's a lighting engineer on the other side, you have a common language. You're pushing in the same direction uh, so we can help resolve some of those problems. So that's coming on later this year. And the last thing I, I will mention, we, um, we did get some funding to launch a new initiative in New Mexico. Uh, new Mexico has never had a night uh, dark sky chapter despite having the first dark sky ordinance, uh, state ordinance, uh, state policy in the US, I think back in 1999. So we're working with advocates there to try and stand up a chapter and then do some stakeholder engagement to see if we can bring people together with an appetite to update the night sky ordinance, get more new municipalities, adopt light pollution policies and get more dark sky places going uh, throughout the state, which has got some incredible dark sky resources as well. So that's the other thread is like trying to find the funding and resources so that we can provide a little bit of additional professional support to all the great volunteer support that's out there so that we can accelerate our progress with the ultimate goal, you know, that, you know, within a decade, we've demonstrated that we can start to reverse, slow down the rate of increase, get it back down and in place and start to reverse you know, the runaway rate of light pollution around the world. So thank you. Great. Let's uh, give Ruskin a round of applause here. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, again, if there's, we're going to do a Q and A here for a little bit, um, and uh, we're going to. If you have any questions, you can either uh, write to me directly in the chat or just write it overall in the chat. That's either way is fine. Um, so I will start with some questions. Uh, so um, in your travels around the world, you've seen a lot of examples of how people or groups can make an impact on reducing artificial lighting 
uh, what's one specific example that you found that particularly inspiring and hope that will be replicated elsewhere? Great question. And um, the, the sad thing is, I mean, over the last four years, I spent an awful lot of time in Tucson, right, in my office, <laughs> uh, working from home. But I have been fortunate to be able to travel some places. And, and, and one really stands out, and that was being in Europe a couple of times last year. And, and literally, if you're in Fulda, uh, Germany, which is a dark sky community, or in fact, if you're in Vienna, you can set your watch uh, by when the public monument lighting goes off. I think it's 10 p.m. in Fulda, and literally we were racing to the, be at the front of the cathedral so that we could watch the lights go down as they turned off the public monument lighting there at 10 p.m. They do it every day. Um, but it, it was even more exciting then to see to be in Vienna last fall meeting with the, the uh, International Illuminating Commission. Um, and I think maybe it was 11 o'clock there, but 11 o'clock there, there's the big, if you've been to Vienna, there's the big cathedral. I think it's St. Stephen's that is very brightly lit. And at 11, again, it goes dark. And so it's just a, a, an example. It, you know, light pollution, you know, solving light pollution is yes, it is a very technically complicated project, but actually it's relatively simple when you get right down to it. So it's making the decision when not to light. Uh, and I think we're seeing more and more of that in Europe, um, driven by the energy crisis. They're realizing they can save an awful lot of energy. The, I'm heading off to Asia tomorrow, and I think some of the cities in, in Asia are doing the same, where they're just saying, yeah, we're going to have a light show, but then we're going to turn it off. And so I think that's really part of the encouragement here. It's like, we just need to learn how to get by with less. And I know that's not a very popular message in any of this, whether you're working in the climate space or in the light pollution space, but when you can turn it off, turn it off. I would just bridge it through to some of the conversations that are happening in, in Utah at the moment. I know in Weber County and others, there's some desire to sort of light up the, 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 the Utah monument, the temples. And I think if you're going to do that, there's, there's a way of doing it also, except at a certain time of night, you turn them off. So it becomes a special, it becomes a moment. You have that, but you let the night be the night at a certain point. All right, great, thanks. Uh, Janet has a question, Janet Muir. Uh, where globally do you think the best dark sky policy opportunities lie and where are the most challenging areas? I think the best opportunities at the moment there's a couple of ways of answering that. I think in Europe, um, we're, we participated with the Czech Republic last year in Europe. Um, and when they had the, 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 their, the head of the European Commission there, they put light pollution on the table as one of their key policies. They, they'd be dealing with some cross-border issues where greenhouses in Poland were spilling into some of the dark parks in the Czech Republic. So they made that one of the priorities of their presidency. Um, the, 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 I mean, I think the approach that they took was smart. They recognized that the politics in Europe at the time did not, were not that, that they could bring a new light pollution mandate or directive in place. But what they could do is demonstrate how existing EU policies and laws could be applied to light pollution. Now, the challenge of the European Union is every six months, there's a new presence. It's currently Spain. They haven't picked up the baton. But so I think there are opportunities in Europe just because of the scope and scale of what's going on. And, you know, it's also an incredibly light polluted place. Um, I think the US will continue to be extremely challenging to tackle at a national level. I think we're going to see the opportunities happen at the municipal, large municipal level, and hopefully at the state level. Um, and I know it's probably not popular, but, you know, some of the countries out there where you have, maybe you're not quite as de democratic as some of other countries, like what's going on in uh, there's a lot of desire in Saudi Arabia, which is one of the most light polluted places in the world, to actually in their new developments to do, to do them right from the start. And I think that's a really exciting movement as well. All right, great, thank you. Um, Kaylin Jones has a question. You mentioned dark sky accredited lighting designers. Are you intending that to be narrow or also include dark sky accredited architects, landscape architects, planners, code enforcement staff, who may not specialize yeah, so, and be the primary influencer on a project? Yeah. Yeah, great, great question. So um, the, the intent is to build out a program that can be an add, add on to all of those other professional accreditations. So if you are an American, an APA accredited planner, then you could take a course in dark sky lighting and you could understand how to apply that in your work. So we're, we're, we're targeting, yes, lighting designers, but in particular planners, architects, 
but also the distributors, the electricians, all the other people who make decisions about lighting who have no idea what they're doing. You know, I, I, you know people idea have said for years, like no one, no one wakes up in the morning and says, I want to pollute the, light, not the night sky. <laughs> they just don't understand how the decisions that they're making are leading to the pollution of the night sky. Yeah, so firing those uh, accreditations or, the, or those certifications to people who've gone through that who are making those decisions is the goal there. All right, uh, Richard Tenney has a question. Uh, my experience has been the number one selling point with city councils and businesses is dollars. Uh, the question that needs answering, what's the return on investment shifting to lower wattage fully shielded lighting? Uh, what do we do with the thousands of wrong lights we already have? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the transitions, as we know, over the last decade to the, the LED revolution have been very much driven by energy savings. And a company will come to a city and say, look, we can replace all your lights with energy efficient bulbs, and you don't have to pay us anything. And, and then the net result in, in some instances has been a good outcome, and in many instances has been an outcome. So dollars and cents really matter. Um, there has some good early work done by the DOE that in the solid state lighting report from last year, I think really says a lot of the future savings will come from lighting control, from dimming them down and turning them off. Uh, we are working with the standard setting bodies like IES to make sure that controls and in a sense, dynamic zoning, a, a street that's zoned for high levels of traffic during the day, during commute hour can be zoned differently at the night and can have a lower light level in the night. So I think when you start to see some of that ripple through the codes and it will give the cities uh, the ability uh, to say, yes, we need to meet the code requirements whilst or the standard requirements while at the same time lowering the overall light impact. Um, and you know, part of the work we're doing developing application guidance, we hope we can start to put some dollars and cents on this. But, but both dollars and cents would also quantify you know, how many less lumens are you putting up into the sky. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to have one last one for you from uh, Jody Giroux. Uh, what is the most, best, most layperson friendly dark sky ordinance you've come across? In co authoring one for my community, we tried to simplify the language to make ours understandable. Curious if, if you've found a really great one. That's a great question. I mean, I, I, I wish I could answer that. I mean, I think every community, you almost thought that, John, I mean, I think every community is different. Every community knows what it cares about. Um, and I don't think there is a one size fits all solution here. I don't think. You, the, the, you can't assume that what will work in Moab will work in Pittsburgh, right? Clearly, very different situations. But I think what is needed and, and what we're committed to developing this year is, is a template for a simple, like a five-page template based upon our five principles for responsible lighting. And there, there, there are some simple steps that a city can take. Clearly, every city, every new public light should be shielded. Every new public light should uh, be on a dimmer or a smart controller so it's turned off when it's new not not needed and every new public light in general should they should use a lower color temperature those are some simple steps uh, that every city could take and write in and then lead by example uh, always the challenge will be where how, how you always question like what about enforcement how do you get the private sector along etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think it's up for each community then to really assess what is the appetite of this community to push these requirements onto other sectors. Um, if it's a dark sky gateway community that really sees tourism as its future, yeah, it might wanna push that out and come up with an incentive program to change out the lights on all the commercial res residences. And hopefully once we've developed that they could have some form of recognition for doing that. Um, and I, But I think that the realization, again, working with the board over the last year, don't let, the, the desire for the perfect ordinance get in the way of taking the first step. It's really important you take the first step, let people know that, hey, we've taken the first step. Quality light, look, it's an improvement. The world didn't end. We didn't come and take out your lights or shoot them out. And then let's take the next step. Let's keep going. And I think really that that's the message going forward. Let's, let, let's focus on the practicable. Let's get some stuff done. Let's celebrate those wins and let's keep going forward together. All right, thanks. That's a great way to finish up. Uh, and I think uh, Lisa is gonna take us out now. Thank you a lot, Ruskin. Thanks, Emil. Thank you, Ruskin, for that lovely presentation.
Anil, thank you for facilitating all the questions. Frankly, there are some more questions. I will be documenting those. And um, I would love to ask Ruskin and our co-hosts, perhaps we can try to address some of these questions and share that as a group afterwards. So to make sure that we really address today's um, discussions. So I wanted to say, um, we have a few minutes left, but I wanted to reserve a few bit of time in the course of this hour. First, thank you for joining us. I hope you have learned some things or at least gained some insights from this quarterly connections meeting, um, particularly on um, who we are, what we do and why it matters is what the focus was of our meeting today. And it was um, kind of a, a, a tall order to gather you. So we're so pleased that you came here. Um, as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, our main hopes uh, by planning this series is to bring people together um, to from across the Colorado Plateau and beyond to have a forum where we can meet and get to know each other and um, discuss these kinds of issues. Um, and going forward, we do have a lineup of um, other four meetings in this the course of this year, and we hope to do it continually um, over time. Our next meeting, we do have um, Jordan Smith who is the, um, my supervisor and he is the director of the Institute of Outdoor Recreation and Tourism, who is, uh, will be sharing his research on economic impacts with related to dark sky tourism across the state of Utah. So by having these experts, Ruskin, thank you so much for being part of today's discussion and sharing, um, the updates going on with Dark Sky, um, the challenges that we are all facing and uh, providing some guidance. I really appreciate that. Um, as we go forward, um, we have one more meeting that is planned with Jordan S Smith, but as we have um, drawn from you each today, understanding who you are and perhaps in our follow-up survey that's to come, if you could comment on other things you'd like to hear and focus on and we really do wanna hear from you. Um, so there are so many of you all working um, in your own diverse, unique ways. Um, we want to support you. We want to work with you. We wanna work as, as, um, as a, a broader community. So um, John, Barentine, Aneth Seal, Anil Seth, your, your time today was very valuable to help me facilitate. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all at our next meeting. Um, you will need to register for that separately. And um, that will be on June 7th um, in, um, at one o'clock Mountain Daylight Time. And um, what you can expect from right following this meeting is an email. And we do encourage you to look at our feedback survey. Um, it's so you can provide um, how we did today and suggestions for how we can um, make it a little more salient to your needs and expectations. So um, I will be um, closing out the meeting today. Um, thank you so much for joining us and I hope to see you next time. <laughs>